which means that it must be positively getting optimistic any minute. Um, I think that the net will exist in some poverty-stricken shape or form come the middle of October, but I still cannot quite tell you where, and uh, also have to mention that you'll have to put your hand in your pocket a bit for it. But things are looking a bit more hopeful. The response to the questionnaire has been very, very good. It's something like 80% you know, of the cards that I sent out have had yeses back, and only Hugh Casson said no bugger off, which is, is something of a positive, I think, in a way. Um, now, this evening is, is a sort of rallyette situation, or what? Basically, <coughs> Cedric and I are supposed to be old hands at, at this kind of uh, event, and Pedro has never given a chat here and ought to have done long ago, so they're making up for an omission. I want to talk about Unbuilt England. Um, I will admit straight, straight away to you, because the fairly unusual instance of people giving a lecture from notes is to do with the fact that this text is mainly the introduction to the October issue of A plus U, which will come out talking about unbuilt England. Uh, and as I've never really built anything, and I'm supposed to be sort of English, very English, um, they asked me to edit this issue. And in fact, a, a, a rather unhealthily large number of people who are sitting here have projects in that, in that uh, issue of A plus U. And I thought that in a way, when I was reading through it, that it might make some kind of a, a chat. And also, secondarily, it has certain implications. I think it does act as a kind of historical manifesto of, of why the net exists and why it has to exist. And a sort of historical look back at some things which are certainly familiar to, again, unhealthily, rather high proportion of the people sitting here, either quoted, shown on the screen, or uh, kind of hinted at. Never mind. It's a club. <laughs> it's a club. Um, and so, I hope it won't be too boring for me to basically read from the text, uh, with a few sort of insertions from time to time. Basically, then, this notion of unbuilt isn't just the business of post-rationalization of the fact that very few of us do build or can build or have got anything to build at this moment in time. I think that the notion of unbuilt rather than built suits a country where so much is gentle or implicit or wry, where culture emerges rather than is defined, where from a distillation of high ideals that come from Europe, uh, the physical impediment of the channel seems to deliberately lose the trajectory of things. It seems to deliberately pervert goals, um, and they're con consciously jettisoned most of the time. I mean, we, we pretend that we've lost, lost the original idea, but in fact we quite deliberately jettison the high European ideals in favour of the English preference that all things might be relevant and most things should be interdependent. So rhetoric is traded for the tradition of the reasonable. Individuality matters more than polemic. And the outcome of plurality of society must be some kind of continuity and not revolution. And the culture so described is a particular version of North European nonconformism. After all, most English are a mixture of North, Saxon, French with traces of Celt. Their tradition of cultivated thought, and I think we often forget this, is really in inherited from the upper middle classes of the 18th and 19th centuries, they always seem to be looking southwards. And there's still a hell of a lot of that looking southwards of, of the, of the favoured groups that even goes on today. Um, and the more contemplative mystic fringes of the islands, the Scots, the Welsh and the Irish, or, or what I always refer to as the Celtic fringe, and I sometimes refer to some of my um, hairier friends as Celtic fringe, even if they were born in... St. Albans, um, remaining as suppliers of strange, but often the most original personalities whose efforts become absorbed by the metropolitan South. And I think with such a background, one can understand the relevance of the unbuilt, the architectural thinking that can only be discussed. It's no secret that the English are far stronger in writing and acting and debating 
than, for instance, in painting and sculpture. And this literate strength interwoven with the perhaps humanitarian traditions, which also were occurring in the 18th and 19th centuries, um, trailing the Industrial Re Revolution, the cultivated mill owners providing public libraries and corporate chocolate makers building townships for their workers. So that the innate, but often, particularly in the swinging 60s, but nevertheless the, the, the underlying Puritanism of the English becomes interwoven with speech and perverse provinciality. And we understand the emotional as well as the logical reasons for concern, particularly for things like public housing, which runs on and on from generation to generation. We understand the significance of the public building as a social beacon, bathhouses, schools, meeting halls, as well as the libraries standing out in the town, as once did the castle and the church. But with the development of generic form and invention, especially in Victorian times, that has little to do with the monument or the grand house from which the stylization of those same buildings seems to have come. Oh, damn. Um. I think a final clue to the instinct of English design comes from the strongest area of English art, the compositions and observations of rural painters and the suggestiveness of the watercolour tradition from the gardeners of the 18th century who combined an instinct for the picturesque with the reality of diminutive undulation, which is the raw material of the English countryside. All of this soft, romantic, episodic, as are English stories, as is English architecture, as are the characters in English plays, Form is, the following, is following the mood of English conversation, discussive rather than polemical, incident rather than heroism. And despite the international style and literacy which in these days must increasingly validate itself towards North America, and despite the role of England as a low-budget aircraft carrier moored off Europe, it does remain a deep romanticism and episodicness in our architecture because it's the way we think and it consists very often of dreams rather than solutions. On the other hand, outside art, natural theory, or all of that, in the country at large, architecture is, always seems to be discussed in pragmatic terms. Style is mistrusted, unless it's the traditional style of the area. And innovation occurs more frequently in plan or in section, which are, on consideration, the dimensions that can't be understood by the layman. And another tradition comes into play, that of the small-scale inventor, or the boffin. I think with this long history of small inventions and industrial modifications, the English enjoy nothing better than to play around with the basic idea, weaving little variations and creating vignettes. And when applied to plan organization of a building, it seems to result in extreme cleverness in small parts, even if the whole remains quite commonplace. In this way, our architectural philosophies have emerged and have meandered on, irrespective of outside battles for rationalism or modernism, which have both, in their way, been victims of deliberate, the same deliberate ignorance, this deliberate choice to ignore, deliberate misinterpretation, and so, eventual dissolve. And the next architecture, which has to happen after the so-called postmodernism, I mean, as I see, postmodern is, is, is just a sort of wanking session in between two uh, more determinate periods of architecture. Um, I think this next architecture will undoubtedly be treated in the same way. It's our nature to distort and deliberately forget. It's our cussedness, it's our national cussedness. On the other hand, we mustn't forget that most of the things that we talk about um, are produced in the circumstance of London. And so what we see here is a distorting mirror of England or alternatively an outpost of the more determined world of architecture to the south and to the west and to the east. Some of it that we see is by non-English who are nevertheless an essential part of the London scene. And some of it is quite deliberately urbane as a reaction to that cosy English thing. I think that prag pragmatism can only be fought by bouts of wild optimism, dreams and fancies that undermine the Puritan instincts 
and rekindle the romantic in instincts. Invention can be piled upon invention until the resultant beast resembles a monster. And I think here we much more share the perversity of the Austrians, or the Italians, or the Catalans, or whoever, those intoxicated moments when a few architects dare each other to overreach the polite limits of English constraint. And at such moments, the boffin thing and the picturesque thing come together, and that's sort of magic, you know? The security of this is understood by other Europeans probably better than ourselves, but rarely by Americans. For I think it's with the other Europeans that we actually share the fundamentals of the culture. To Americans, the whole of the European thing is too mysteriously wayward and indulgent, which explains, I think, the absence of any English equivalent of the East Coast Greys or the New York Whites, and the Silvers would anyhow be unlikely in such territory. There isn't any urbane peerage of a single style, almost only a Byzantine network of influences, and actual personal linkages between the architects themselves, what one might politely call soft plurality. Few doors barred. The great and internationally famous James Sterling is just Big Jim, the man across the street in the old blue pullover. The and yet, at the same time, we have to remember the, the context of this, the quantity of the context, that there are maybe 25,000 qualified architects, 10,000 students, maybe another 5,000 sort of designers, critics, hangers-on in general. Um, and a third of these are in London. And 80% of the buildings that get published and 90% of the projects that win prizes or get discussed and 95% of the publications come from this one place, which is a, we often forget, again sitting in this place. And the prestige building for the whole country designed in that two mile strip that runs east from Marble Arch. And an immense, in the grassroots, an immense uh, mistrust of the strip. Immense. You only have to just go up any, you know, half provincial town to see this incredible mistrust of what happens in the two mile strip east of Marble Arch. And at the same time there was, I think in the English scene, a curious avoidance of often discussion even. And, and, I, and here I would blame the magazines of late as much as, as just people chatting around. Uh, an avoidance of real criticism or even of defense or even of enthusiasm, which really upsets me the most. There's just sort of nuance and, and sort of vague, non-said hints. And, and uh, of course, on the other side, there's this curious, irritating English thing that even a very important old architectural battle that may have simmered for 10 years between two factions or two individuals will be maybe resolved one day in a very seedy pub where, um, and, and the guys involved have forgotten completely what it was about, but they'll just remember that, that it's about time they had a pint. You know, it's brilliant. Very soft. I think, on the other hand, there is this recent history and the vague, you know, that the architect is seen by the public as a friendly, rather vague and rather sad individual, usually on the defensive, shamed by recent history that reminds him of the disasters of prefabrication or high-rise or craft urban development. And as a species, he's so undefined as, as, as really for me not to be very interesting and I think one has to actually consciously avoid such an animal because in the final analysis it can't you know it, it can't be of much help and and one sometimes deliberately pitches quite a vicious avoidance of such animals I think that almost all the people who sitting in this room showing things like 40 London architects or the peer room A plus the or you know the the, the club if you like uh, maybe the majority of them are far from seedy. They might be arrogant, they might be young, they might be eccentric, they might be beautiful, they might be, for the English, embarrassingly intellectual, they might even be cake or even foreign, and they've mostly chosen to exist alongside the strip, because, after all, many of them teach, which creates a sort of hermetic within a hermetic. Um, though I think it has something to do with the scarcity of buildings to build. Mostly they choose to float on a tiny sea of optimism or invention or ideas. 
And after all, many of them are the third generation since what we keep calling modern architecture. Except, of course, modern architecture hardly ever happened here in the first place. And it might be useful to go back to that, because I think, historically, the early British schools of architecture, as in the States, there was this unhealthy over-awareness of the École de Blazard. And the two great old schools, the AA and, and Liverpool, saw fit to imitate, in their early days, saw fit to imitate the output of the École de Blazard whilst maybe on the side taking a sort of English moral line of argument to prop it up. And I suspect that they probably suppressed much of the best of the instinct for nonconformity, uh, which one has to come back to, which may well have been the origin of arts and crafts movement or art and mm -hmm. which actually was going on in the art schools, where there was sometimes a thing called an architecture room tacked on. And the way which scholars that came out of these architecture rooms um, had necessarily to make their way to London and somehow get involved with the, the, the strip, as it was then, where the vernacular, the craft-based thing, could be married with some of the overtones of European mannerism. And I think it's here that the myth originates of the, of the two-mile strip. I think it gives a sidelight on the difference between the inventive but essentially provincial basis of a lot of English architecture in the first half of, of this century, and a totally different world of the European avant-garde. And my hunch is that it may well have been the chic of Paris modernism that appealed to this little cultured clique in the 1930s in London. London. May have been its chic, or the chic of the idea of the avant-garde, rather than the actual reformist zeal of the original group, so that it appealed to this little uh, clique of uh, peppered with dilettantes and buccaneering colonials and the odd product of Liverpool. And so it needed the authenticity of the emigre, the real political emigres, or, or at least the Lebetkins, the Corns, the Mendelssohn, the Shemayas, and so on, to give it some sort of spunk. And I think from the natives, the planning remains too self-consciously a reaction to both our planning. And unlike Germany, there weren't any very sophisticated romantics. We had our own sort of provincial romantics, but they weren't very sophisticated. So you get a tremendous imbalance of basically Beaux-Arts thinking with, with modern uh, facades. And one has to really quite honestly report that the high modern architecture in England both hardly exists and is highly provincial. And there's probably less of real quality than in Czechoslovakia or Sweden, and probably only about the same amount as in Norway. Now, there's, there's a fascinating hint of a world that never came. The, some of the guys stayed, like Lebetkin and Tor Korn, and he became the chairman, Arthur Korn became the chairman of a Mars Group team that I think produced the only really heroic piece of modernist city planning in England, a diagram of great parallel city strips running north and south with wedges of parkland running between. An offshoot of that same Mars group, which had produced in 37 a very tatty, it looks pretty tatty in the, in the photographs, funny little uh, modern architecture exhibition in, in a Cork Street gallery. Very self-conscious. So then, one's coming from this same background, there was this gleam in the eye of the frustrated architects of the war of Mars and Tecton and those who'd had, during the war, time to read the books of Corb and the back issues of the reviews. And so we get the Festival of Britain, which could have potentially been their platform, or was potentially their platform, the national jamboree to extol survival of the country and the centenary of the Great Exhibition. But what it actually led to was this awful provincial Swedish-influenced architecture, um, which I grew up with and I think is still Again, in the provinces, the, the main modern architecture that one can find, um, with its, its very wet romanticness. There was a validity, so-called, of materials. There was something in the nature of both the Swedish inspiration and the earlier one that is reminiscent of our homespun preference for understatement. And this festival style, which affected every town and village as pastiche of manufactured materials, stripped together on flat facades, 
with concrete frames framing almost everything from their own frames to the next frame up in the scale. But fortunately, there was another generation waiting in the wings which had been more, perhaps more assiduously reading the books of Corb and looking at the reviews and watching the achievements of Mies. And I quote Peter Smithson, I won't do it in Smithsonian dialect, um, really. He says, <coughs> in 1949, I spent four quid on Johnson's book on Mies. It was world-shaking. But what we wanted to find out was how to use Mises' methods without any mannerisms. At the time, there were reasons for all that deadpan de detailing. Even if we'd had the money, we wouldn't have made it more elaborate. And a sense of history, as well as a self-consciousness of their avant-garde activity, which I think is the central difference of that group of people, made this new generation less humble and less provincial than those who spanned the war. Not only had they got more energy, but simply more talent, I think. Their methods were those familiar in pre-war Europe, pre-war metropolitan Europe. The writing of manifestos, the making of projects that were not necessarily going to be built, of holding meetings, forming groups, and making gallery shows. The watershed event, as we all know, was This Is Tomorrow, held at the Whitechapel Gallery, which itself is an arts and crafts monument. Perhaps because its real initiative seems to have come from artists and Curiously, some of the earlier generation of abstractionists were there in the, in the background. Um, the exhibition and its accompanying manifestos was more audacious and more consistently experimental than one would have ever expected from quiet old England. And for later generations, it's this audacity that really makes it historically significant and creates, I think, the starting point for anything that, that any of us are involved in. I'm quoting here Summerson in his description of it. He says, I again can't possibly imitate Summerson's marvellous sense. One of the oddest exhibitions since the war, not strictly architectural, but an exhibition of form. It contained futurist blasphemy, Dada idiocy, some of the Puritanism of the steel, and several brands of surrealism, and, and was called, believe it or not, This Is Tomorrow. Critics hastened to correct the title in the all too obvious way. This was yesterday right enough, but seen through the eyes of those for whom yesterday is already history, a generation taking nothing on trust and testing soundings of another, angrier generation. The significance of that exhibition was allied to the significance of a pretended new movement, jocularly designated the New Brutalism. I say pretended because it is an open question whether the movement exists, and I think that's a lovely point to make, you know, whether it matters that a movement exists, something which Chartnet has often uh, had to think about, or whether it matters that it matters. I say pretended, yes, because it's an open question whether the movement exists, suppose it does, it is an easy thing for elders to explain away at once as, quite simply, the old rigour, which it probably is. And then we get Peter Bannum's quotation of the same area. Hunstanton School and the house in Soho, both by the Smithsons, can serve as the points of reference by which the new brutalism in architecture can be defined. What are the visible and identifiable characteristics of these two structures? Both have formal axial plans. Both exhibit their basic structure and make a point of exhibiting their materials. Water and electricity don't come out of unexplained holes in the wall, but are delivered to the point by visible pipes and manifest conduits commonly regarded as being anti-art, or at any rate, anti-beauty. And one must remember that the first comment is from a sober, arcane historian who admits to having written the audacious captions to the original Mars Group exhibition 18 years before, and the second from the then wild man of English architectural criticism, very much inside the group that created This, Tom this Is Tomorrow, which was called the Independent Group. And one might easily ask, independent from what? I think certainly independent from the memory of the festival and independent to create a new direct architecture. Now so far I've said very little about the context of unbuilt architecture. For in England we have that compound of social responsibility or civic activity and a consistency of small fields and small hills, always interlaced by plenty of evidence of human activity, which seems to suggest a natural model for a very magic kind of urbanism. 
Yet the first steps at that time were reinterpretations of Dutch or Corbusian thinking, perhaps combating the temptation just to extend market towns as images of themselves, certainly no revivalism, and the placement of the new amongst the fields and hedges and flowers, so that what is usually referred to as, as most symptomatic of the time, the zone project of Crook, Derbyshire and Volker, is described by David Gray as having no Gallic polemics, the drawings only in form, and are not calculated to seduce the observer. Individual dwellings and single buildings to the overall evolution of a city-scale network structure, which by adaptation was capable of use at any point in the country's fabric. This deliberately low keenness, in fact. And I think then we find another curious thing happening centrally to the group of architects who did the, the CM houses, um, a group based on the village, which because the original part of the international became the international team 10, uh, one project came naturally enough from the Smithsons, who from this time on remain, even now, as, as def definitively avant-garde, whatever that means. Um, one scheme from Bill Howe, one from John Weeks, who subsequently built, built it at Rushbrook, and one from the equally useful Jim Sterling. It's, I think, interesting to regard them all of a piece. All have this concern to make a statement to a very obviously international circuit and yet maintain the characteristic Anglo-Celtic cottage, the pitch roof, the small window, the predominance of the wall. And I think the wall is the key upon which one can, can see the seeds of the essential difference between, for instance, Stirling and the Smithsons. Um, in the Smithsons village, the wall formation was pivotal to a whole series of dwellings Whereas in the Sterling example, the walls are much more sculpturally independent and the structure much more plastic. Already we can see the difference between a pair of architects who are thinking in terms of urban patterning, in terms of diagram, if you like, as well, um, and as contrasted with an architect who increasingly displays plastic virtuosity and is less interested in urbanism. And the paradox of these projects is the desire to reflect the pervasive and vernacular virtues of rude British buildings, whilst at the same time making statements to within a radical coterie of foreign architects. And there's a whole story which would be fascinating to hear from somebody about these early relationships, why Sterling was included at that moment in the Team 10 group, uh, the, the vicious criticism given to Kurokawa by the same group of people, and how Lucan relates as a father figure, but that's another somebody else to explain. From now on, anyhow, to me what was important was from now on, the English had escaped their locality. They were audaciously on the international circuit. And for us, who were the next generation, uh, there was a new level of aspiration. It was legitimate, quite respectable, to have friends and allies in any part of the world without a feeling that England was a silly old provincial enclave where Previously, you just looked at glossy books of sharp-shadowed photographs of buildings by people with unpronounceable names. And I think at that point, just before the 60s, the diagram and the drawing began to expand as means of communication. From now right through, into, well into the 70s, the British instinct for bricolage emerges, a gathering together of the like and the unlike, often in a gentle or implicit series of evidence, sections that become cartoons, typewriting that informs the drawing more than the profiles of the building, writing that meanders across fields, plans that turn, turn into diatribes, reports that flow from words to sketches and then back into words again, all manifestations of an increasingly free attitude towards information as idea as information, which we can contrast with the American way of presentation of architectural idea, which usually consists of formal plans elevations, sections. And as our buildings become progressively more perverse or expressionist, the, you can trace also the progress of the use of the axonometric. And I think James, who I believe did this drawing, is sitting here. 
it was started by he and his then partner and then eventually becomes the central means of communication of more or less the whole strip group of people, the, the, ax, the dreaded English axonometric. Um, I think an accompanying literacy can be traced um, with the confidence of the new, much more relaxed drawings. The real knowledge of Colin Rowe or Alan Cahoon or maybe the strange sort of cultural brand tub of Sam Stevens and above all the publication of Wittkever's Architectural Principles in the Age of Humanism and to quote Peter Smithson again, there was this feeling of Palladianism in the air. Everybody was studying his work and it was linked to a mania for, purport, for proportion mathematics. We'd been to Italy to look at the central space churches and when we read Wittkever's book we found he answered many of our difficulties. He had been working on his thesis for probably 30 years. He was one of our masters. We found this Palladianism reappearing again and again in English architecture. He has discipline but there's something in his non-assertive manner that must suit us all. And I think that last line reinforces what I've been saying earlier. Bricolage or rationale. I think there's a necessary moral as well as physical tension between them for a race of romantics bred with conscience. This business of the picturesque perverting the honest. The fiddler boffin is the same person as the reflective thinker. So, if you weren't into all this, you could always relax with the unconcerned development of straightforward <coughs> building technology, uh, which had, after all, come with the impetus of military technology during the war. And the works of the audacious second prize winners, or the brighter students, <laughs> deliberately began to incorporate structural heroics, sometimes of what we call the South American look-no-hands type. Um, and greater and greater size. And this is always the, the spolt hole, I think, for that awful sort of middle group of people, that the, the look no hands thing, or, or let us take the latest state of play of the building techniques. I can't stand it, actually, but, but it's, it's, it's very easy to poke fun at. Um, and fanatical groups, such as the Modular Society, yelled from the pages of AD at the time. Student projects created the image of what was, after all, an interesting idea of the city as a single building, long before the word megastructure had been coined. And inevitably, from the old cultural south came the respectable cultural model, the Algiers plan, which could have been mulled over since 42, clinched by Marseille's, but, and the hero is called, of course. Marseille, what is this love affair with Le Cabousier for the modest English? Is it his perversity? Is it his cultivated eccentricity? The alternative heroes were probably less sympathetic. Mies was too incisive, too Germanic. Uh, I quote Smithson again, which says, Mies is great, but Corb communicates. Uh, which he said in an unguarded moment, I think. Frank Lloyd Wright is too cavalier, and after all is Celt. Um, what we don't like to admit is the possibility, again, that the Paris avant-garde had this magic that, that again, this, as with the, the guys in the 30s, that the, Paris, the thing coming from Paris had this avant-gardeism, um, the ambience of an avant-garde for heroics, experimentation, heroes or models. The image of the alternative city can now be sustained by a texture of domains by preferred technology and can even find a place for prescribed waywardness, for instance, the roof of Marseille. The module itself even appeals to the English because in a way it's undisciplined in its drawing and rather lovable. Look at its funny shaped hand whilst making its sober message. The disservice done to such a hero and to such models can be seen throughout the country. Corbusian slabs that are too small, too close, too arid, lacking in the integrity of the whole actual mechanism of Corb's original planning. And so, yet the 50s turned it towards another architecture for the 60s. The English genius for misinterpretation and its tactic of disintegration. Out of Marseille came twisted and mauled and strung out animals of buildings. A few carved into the great slabs as they created them. We, with picturesque 
zeal, they scattered the bits so that the Dalton Lot Early Fraser housing project this is triggered uh, is triggered by the Swiss French rationale, but is certainly not it. In fact, it's, in retrospect, it almost seems folksy, of course, which is the old English thing coming up again. But I think uh, Rowe does it, explains it better. Quoting the A exhibition which contained that building, the A manner of the moment is a little like an outburst of Pont Street Dutch after a wave of Belgravian stucco, capable of fitting into the London scene and of augmenting its variety. It is therefore a paradoxical style which betrays a preference for the particular rather than the general for the striking rather than the exemplary, in some ways a deliberate sabotage of the older modern architecture. Thus dry bones of the Villaradiers are ruthlessly agitated and the unité at Marseille is violently hacked about. The amalgam is savagely stirred to be ultimately moulded with a regard for its potential terribilita, which is a sort of rowist word. And Rowe articulates this deliberateness of the sabotage, which I think is the most significant intellectual step taken by an architectural milieu at that point since the war. Its methods may be hairy, its instincts, again, episodic, but its effects still the currency of the ar architectural avant-garde. I mean, you can take that row passage and more or less apply it exactly at the same moment to the present exhibition around the corner. And, and that conversation, this fragmentation, this deliberate sabotage, I think anticipates the the Jenks postmodernism by whatever number of years it is. At the soft end, and we must, after all, in London have a soft end, the Maison Jao was an obvious model for a whole generation of people who might otherwise have had to resort to more obvious vernacular. What could be better for those little houses in Hampstead and Highgate than a technology based on stock brick and shattering made from planks? Then as a development, the structural frame could be seen as a restriction. Space could be carved out, and an artificial cave could be thrown up by means of cross walls, bolts, nooks, and eventually the whole mixture that became called crumbly. The, on the strip, at that moment, and we're now moving to the end of the 50s, beginning of the 60s, there was, after all, Killick teaching at the AA, and his partner, Bill Howe, teaching at the Poly. James, this James here, at the A and his then partner, Sterling, at the Poly. There was Smithson also teaching at the A and, and there was this seesaw situation which at that point in time between the Poly and the A was really very exciting, an underground that could use the characteristic strengths of not just one school but two. Perhaps the Poly's predilection for surface and fabric against the A's flair for organization and composition and bullshit. And Peter Smithson began to lecture and write on such preoccupations as place and connectivity and cluster and so on. Um, it's quite interesting to quote, at this point, Sterling in Polygon 2, um, I think a slightly uneasy quote, where he says, mankind in the industrially civilized countries only too often feels contained and repressed by the falsities of the social and economic systems he has organized for himself. These conditions motivate and largely explain the questing for romantic backwaters in which so many people indulge, maybe the South Sea Islands, nomadic Marco Polo journeys to Mandalay by canoe, etc. Insofar as this mental climate affects our project designs, we can take the lead from one of two main themes. Either the escapist plasticity of Ronchamp, or in contrast, America's rational creations of brittle anonymity. And that's Sterling writing in Polygon in 58. The word Baalism was coined to describe the most excessive and brilliant student style. Even the imperturbable historian Pevsner has to re-scramble many of his icons of the modern movement in a key lecture of 61 called Modern Architecture, the Historian, or the Return to Historicism. Form followed upon form. Bowels were challenged by facets, and the brilliant Edward Reynolds creating factories and concert halls as a student that in fact anticipates the work of the, his, his own teachers, Hal Killick, etc., when making their projects, and is even suggested as having influenced his, his factory, having influenced perhaps, dare one say it, in this company, the, the, the Leicester roof. It's been said by somebody else anyhow. Formal excitement is at a pitch. There are medieval revivalists, nicknamed Christian weirdies. There are cult lectures on Voise and the art 
Arts and Crafts movement. It's, it's really very dissimilar from, I mean, it's very similar to now. Hardly dissimilar at all. Cult lectures on boys in the Arts and Crafts movement, being attended by the vanguard designers of plastic bubbles. There are students influencing their teachers, who are themselves pushing the formal boundaries out at the same speed. So the old roles are abandoned. There is a taste, or more, a native preference for meandering pathways, those veins that are once, at once romantic and part of the aggregate development of an old landscape. We come back to this, this influence, I think, always there, of the, land, the tradition of the English wayward landscape, small waywardness. In, in 50s and 60s conversation, it was the establishment of the root or the spine that always came first, which was perhaps procedural as well as organic. From the spine, there grows a fishbone structure, and then the flesh, which can be almost anything. And <clears throat> I think through team, the Team 10 connection, perhaps, this influence was felt outside England. Went back, for once, we were actually pushing something back into the European mainstream, felt in Holland and Germany, though in those places, the hundreds of linear cities that you get seem to lose the English magic. Whilst still English, they romanticize this essential set of needs. Where in Europe it becomes formalized. The needs of the guts for the spine, the bowels, the facets, the veins. It is at this moment picturesque, but no longer fey. And I think we had for a fleeting moment a heroic style. Before long the Puritan backlash was felt. Even the supporters were conscience stricken. The more sober members of experimental groups returned to their books, and perhaps it's more, by then, more respectable discuss, to discuss typology than form making. But, but before I leave this heady moment, I'd just like to quote Warren Chalk on, on John Outram, who says, I, I call it a word from a fan, good chemistry is like visiting old friends, animated iconographs, a whiplash of implied animation, each element coordinated, sequenced, Functions happening just at the right moment. Here is the intensity of sensation, tissue, bone, cell, fused into an occurrence. The old local hippodrome raising itself from the sludge and the beautiful graphic Englishness of it all. Parapets waiting for the invasion of the Ashfelter. But then, of course, we find, I would think in irritation, I quote from Ed Jones, who says... The early 60s were very much in the shadow of the preceding Smithsonian era, characteri characterized by a distrust of the private will to form, a reaction against the preceding imagist phase, and feeling that pre-architectural factors should be emphasized. It was hoped that the general preoccupation with programmatic matters would eventually lead to the, re the evolution of general building types, a general neutra neutrality of expression supported by the newfound ordinariness of Max Bill's uh, Hochschule at Ulm and the products of Brown. Now, Jones, of course, was a member of the most talented, cool group, which was at the vanguard of this reaction, who found themselves discussing the reinterpretation of European modern architecture with critics such as Cahoon, or observing the refined qualities of the work of Atelier V, or even the first delineated projects, there I say it, of Cedric Price, who, like the Smithsons, would from now on become that a very necessary irritant and, and central part of the avant-garde system. And, and Bob Maxwell has a very good description of, of this situation. He says, cool architecture is now making a decided re-entry. In place of romantic or frenzied silhouettes, the calm rational envelope, cool diagrams, Cedric Price, coolness in all circumstances, a renewed interest in rationality and rational frameworks. The Grunt Group's achievements, a Miesian cast. This coolness is decidedly Dutch in tone, uncompromising in layout, tender in detail. <coughs> Trees and hedges provide a necessary counterpoint to the regularity of the layout. They stand for the va validity of life. Regimentation is not the intention, but rather the creation of a steady background in front of which life can become more visible and more intelligible. And of course, the word steady, I think, is very carefully chosen for the English audience. The, the grunt of the grunt group, which, contrary to general belief, I didn't invent, 
the term. But the grant of the grant group, which is generally assumed at that moment to have included Chris Cross, Mike Gold, Jeremy Penella Dixon, Ed Jones, etc., was therefore, I think, a grant of seriousness and asceticism. Thank you, Mike. Uh, though it has its origins uh, in the actual throatal noise made by the members um, and their generally quiet English manner. Consistency and dedication to aims certainly mark them off at this moment from the rest of the two-mile strip. On the other hand, of course, back to real mainstream, in competitions, the prize win winners were using a language which was as much the continuation of Corbusian dissection and the Smithsonian influences, it was not yet cool. And in the heroic instance of Eldred Evans' competition scheme, prize winning competition scheme for Lincoln, 1961, the influence was actually from Blue Khan. And for a young girl to win a major competition was exciting, but the feeling of a new serious wind this time came not from the South, it came from North America, it was unnerving reinforced probably by the return of several bright young men from the offices of Skidmore back to the Strip and the influential teaching slots in the schools. We find the grants being taught maybe by John Winter or Adrian Gale and a technological version of coolness, Mies becoming a safer model than the wayward Corbusier. From the Polytechnic, a sub team, including Steve Osgood that, that wins a string of second prizes, <coughs> And uh, another group which one began to hear about, con consisting of people who worked at the LCC, the GLC of the day, including a man called Ron Heron, Warren Chalk, Dennis Crumpton, David Attenborough, and somebody called Waterhouse, um, with an architecture that is highly influenced by the Smithsons and Corb simultaneously. Smithson influence and Corb influence simultaneously. And then, since the trajectory of unbuilt architecture must be seen as a wing of that of built architecture, just as I think the reverse is equally true, there came a building, the actual reality of which, of course, moved the whole game on another 10 or 20 years. And I quote unexpectedly, perhaps, Peter Eisenman, the point that is being made is that the Leicester Engineering Building operates on the level of what might be called the archetypal stuff of architecture, in the same manner that any gesture does that moves away from a rigid stylistic or classical vocabulary. This is an activity continuously as a critique of architecture in an era where functionalism was offered up as a substitution for ideal content. Leicester reaffirms the need for the continuity in the evolution of the formal vocabulary of architecture. And I find myself unexpectedly, you know, emphasizing that last Eisenman sentence. The need for the continuity in the evolution of the formal vocabulary. And so almost, it, it's a building that we're all so familiar with, but, but what the hell? Almost too difficult to use in conversations because we're overexposed to it. And I took a group of last year students to it and the building that they were most vicious about was the one that had been rubbed down their throats for their last eight years, which was this one. We are overexposed to its interpretation and influence, just as we soon will be with the Centre Beauburg. Yet you must just imagine the real impact of it in a cautious and humble architectural milieu. It's reality, and this is where one can't really discuss unbuilt England in, in separation. It's, it's reality. To the English, you have this basic moral underbelly that if it's real, one has to at least discuss it. Um, reality is crucial. Imagine those thousands of apologetic English architects who'd always use the functional, the legislative, or the technical excuses for why their buildings were not able to be exciting or clever or witty or original. With all the same conditioning factors, they did it. And even their best friends, who if they were honest would admit to not having the nerve or the inclination to cascade walls of glass or twist their roofs or stand their towers so gawkishly above a park, were as bemused as any of the plodders. So one day David Green and I slunk into the offices when he and his partner were out and saw the amazing working drawings. When we saw them, we looked, you know, two or three, couldn't believe our eyes. Um, 
And even if the building is now molding and small and over-familiar, in the same way as the rhetoric of this is tomorrow, it made us, at that moment, proud, always in a very chauvinistic way. At this point, I have to mention Archigram, and so I fall back on Peter Bannum, who says, Archigram 1 was ornamented with phrases like, we have chosen to bypass the decaying Bauhaus image, which is an insult to functionalism. Much more important to the group was the dissemination of information, a way of telling students and young architects all the extraordinary goings on which their teachers and the official prof professional press were concealing from them. Issue 3 of the magazine onwards featured Buckminster Fuller, Cedric Price, Mobile Homes, Cornby, Plastic Structures, Arnold Schein, Nelson Friedman, Undersea, Outer Space, and a number of historically disreputable characters like the Berlin Expressionist, the Russian fantasist of the 20s of Futures. Mike Webb's Sin Center was the pioneer proposal for the Palais Ludique. Oh, I should have pressed the button there, no. Um, anticipating both Neo-Babylon by Constant and the Fun Palace by Cedric Price. In shining Archigram's view of the living city as a zone of pleasurable disorder, but concealing in its interstices some hard and original thinking about both structure and mechanical services. And he then discusses my plug-in city and, and uh, Ron Heron's walking city, which he says caused alarm among the older planning establishment because of the thought of the elements of a capital city being put on legs. And I think quite consciously we were, we couldn't have done it without this Ret this international rhetoric of people like Price and the Smithsons, their, their kind of goal, really. Or perhaps, the, as I, a point I'm trying to make, which is the existence of, of Leicester, made a whole lot of things possible. I think I've quoted Bannon also because he is in the category of critics who are both close and sympathetic, and finally ignitive towards the things about which he writes. And I don't think, unfortunately, since they're both both Roe and Barnum are in upstate New York. We have anybody sitting in the city at this moment who can be regarded in anything like the same way, unfortunately. By the mid-60s, Barnum had assumed that role in our case and that in the case of Cedric, which is only matched by that of Roe and the earlier generation on the strip. And it's this necessary relationship between a critic and a group of people who are perhaps being audacious, which I think is very necessary on such a strip. The intention, I'm referring to Archigram here, was always to regenerate the culture of architecture by extending its catchment into other worlds, in maybe technology or consumer durables, whatever. Um, and yet, of course, the Smithsons in a way had been there before because they wrote some years before that. For us, uh, they said, for today we collect ads. For, to, for us, Japan would be the objects on the beaches, the pieces of paper blowing in the street, the throwaway object and the pop package. For today, we collect ads. Ordinary life is receiving powerful impulses from a new source, where 30 years ago, architects found in the field of popular arts, techniques, and formal stimuli. Today, we are being edged out of our traditional role by the new phenomenon of the popular arts, such as advertising. And yet, I think we were essentially less suspicious of that world than the Smithsons. In fact, we devoured it, the necessary collage of good and bad, the architectural and the lay, the mechanistic and the contemplative. Uh, nevertheless, one has to be honest, that there remain enough of the moralist in us to be staggered by imitators' superficial attachment to the imagery or stylization whilst ignoring the proposition. So still, we were really being very correctly um, morally architectural about it. And once again, even at this moment, the, the, the mainstream was relaxing with the development of building technology, just that all this, you know, whether it's the grunts or whatever, it's all a bit uh, highfalutin for us. We're, of course, there are a lot of recent developments in building technology, and that's what we'll do. In particular, I think the architecture schools of England, which had somehow been coerced into universities and polys, whilst at the same time multiplying in number, took very much this technocratic attitude. Emphasis was placed on building technique and planning rather than on conceptual or aesthetic matters. So the mainstream are more than ever dull and plodding and merely make shallow stylistic references to Kahn-like, Grunt-like or Archigram-like thinking. Um, and as our 
concern becomes less building orientated as the grunts became more typologically concerned the way inevitably is open from for the American influence because that fitted this uh, development of building technology and SCSD was, was the thing that was seized upon SCSD shed the SCSD program is sufficiently identifiable and philosophically sharp to attract both the cool and the technologic the proposition that the well service shed with the apparatus of servicing on the roof a totally flexible series of space dividers and a kit of working parts and a cool rectangular envelope what more do you want you have the whole bit um, even if, I suppose, in, in things like the Santa Boberg or, or even our Monte Carlo project, we're influenced by it. But I see it in, in the perspective now as a very easy line down which these, these dullards could uh, go. And alongside the large city projects began to disintegrate in favour of small-scale inventions linked together, with or without the umbrella of the shed. So our native boffin instinct serves the philosophy very well. And a generation of architects grew up, particularly on the school end of the strip, with the choice of mainstream technocracy or inventive technology, of mundane buildings with systems of service and construction, or of assemblages of parts in search of a hierarchy. In other words, architecture just about disappeared. And certainly aesthetics was a dirty word. Um, but in London there was another thing happening which, has, which is the, the dreaded London of the 60s swinging scene and England was only very slowly to be affected by the events of 1968 the thing that always hits one is the schism when talking to anyone who was a young architect in say France or Germany or Scandinavia and then talking to their English contemporary where 68 is hardly identifiable as a date. It's not, after all, as I, a point I've made, not through our lack of moralism that the English wanted to be so societally irresponsible, but I think it was the politicism and the, 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 the idea of 68 and its events were stylistically too polemical and therefore didn't fit our, our gut instinct. And the worldwide disenchantment with consumerism and the seriousness of mood that is characteristic of the 70s is a gradual realisation in England rather than a shrill statement. Now, of course, while all that was happening in the front row here, there was a generation of students which I described at the time as being poppy, arty, and in a way uncool people who didn't need an architectural culture to absorb. Their own thing was infinitely stronger and more attractive. Several of them refused to know who or what Team 10 were and only just sort of heard of, of Bannum's article of a home is not a house. Um, and Venturi's complexity and contradiction was only read by their sort of slightly more aesthetic friends. Um, and I think, nevertheless, it was they who first started on the long road back to aesthetics. It was this group sitting in the front here. Their drawings perhaps had more to do with the world of fashion than of architecture. Their lifestyle more to do with theatre than technocracy, thank God. The most famous of them, peers would say, really, I'm bored by all that housing. I don't want to do a housing. I mean, it's all so dreary, because he's just done a very nice housing scheme. But uh, he and his circle did eventually make this very real housing scheme and crystallise around them a very, for once, the English crystallising around them a, a sense of style, high stylisation. At the same time then, in this, in this phase, just sort of pre-Artnet is the alternative, the effect of the alternative society where young ar English architects caught between the hard politics of mainland Europe and the dropout ethos of North America, anglicising it by drawing upon our tradition of in individualism. I noted at the time when writing of a student that a package from Chris King in the Post yesterday took me 20 minutes to unravel into five matchboxes each containing a set of cards, several tracts, joysticks, a site plan, a motorway plan, and many other assorted goodies. He divides his drawings into what he himself calls his RIBA set, his hippie set. The final presentation of the project included films, slides, a piece of performance art, some hand-on-heart philosophizing, 
Enormous megastructural models all over the room. Mattresses, babies, scaffolding, flashing lights, and hash lace jelly, which everybody ate. Further into the alternative world, his efforts were really, of course, replacements for the Beaux-Arts box of tricks. It was still there, even though it took different forms. And architecture trying to do the least physical thing, maybe documenting the situation at the same time. It's back to, again, to this English thing of bricolage, I think. Projects began to deliberately pervert the urbanized world. Se Seamus McBride, for instance, proposing that a new motorway be, be built upon as soon as it was completed with a row of suburban houses and small back gardens and dangling plants. So that the hard cynicism of the privileged young professional was deeper and perhaps a little more thought through than traditional conscience of the rich. Yet it was to carry through almost to the present day an articulate group such as the street farmers would write things like the plan to seed pavements with grass makes it impossible to walk on the pavements resulting in the use of the street for pedestrians closing the streets to vehicular traffic the plan to unbuild useless buildings reclaims the land and releases materials for reuse it sees the city as a mine of petrified potential the nature of the alternative is irrelevant any real alternative is an act of rebellion and is subver subversive. The quasi-alternative will make the alliance nation of our situation more tolerable. The real alternative changes the situation. 